platform of orthopedic research and education foundation of india uh, today we have dr arvind prashad gupta sir who is a consultant and sports medicine specialist in paras hmri hospital patna so he is teaching us about reverse shoulder arthroplasty uh, he is uh, simplifying the techniques and uh, other things about that the recent advances and all so over to you sir uh, thank you janki so let me start with uh, the share the screen uh, can you see the screen janki yes sir perfect sir so uh, so uh, today topic is reverse shoulder arthroplasty so in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty the glenoid become convex and the humeral head become concave that is opposite to the normal anatomy that is the normal total shoulder arthroplasty in which the glenoid is concave and the humeral head is convex but in reverse shoulder arthroplasty the glenoid become convex and the humeral head become concave so why the need of this surgery nowadays for shoulder problem so we'll discuss about that how this get evolved what are the indication what are the complications of this uh, surgery so we all know shoulder joint is very uh, mobile joint in uh, which uh, because of the articulation of the humeral head and the glenoid in which the humeral head hardly 20 to 30% get in contact with the uh, the glenoid and because of this this uh, joint is hypermobile joint at the same time because of the high mobility the instability also comes and that get fairly uh, 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 this uh, accommodated with the help of the labrum capsule ligament and the muscle particularly the rotator cuff and deltoid that all work around the shoulder joint so if you see in the rotator cuff the supraspinatus first thing it stabilizes the center of the humeral head against the the uh, glenoid uh, particularly in the early stage of abduction when there is fulcrum of the deltoid muscle is there which try to pull the humeral head up but the supraspinatus keep it down in the glenoid cavity the next is the infraspinatus and teres minor this help in passing the greater tuberosity inside the acromial arch in the mid range of abduction and the external rotation of the shoulder joint and we can see here in the coronal section as well as in the axial section how all these four uh, rotator cuff uh, muscle stabilizes the humeral head against the glenoid in the post a superiorly there is supraspinatus that keep the humeral head down inside the glenoid cavity posteriorly there is infraspinatus and teres minor anteriorly there is subscap so all these four muscles act together to hold the humeral head inside the glenoid cavity and make it a stable joint and along with deltoid and the uh, rotator cuff there is other muscle also that work around the shoulder joint that help in ease, ease uh, mo mobility of the shoulder joint and this uh, deltoid uh, this having uh, the uh, the fulcrum uh, the, the superiorly so with the abduction this humeral head try to goes up so this gives the instability to the uh, the shoulder joint but because of the supraspinatus it's keep in the shoulder joint and once supraspinatus is torn this humeral head keep going up that rub against the under surface of the acromion at the same time with the glenoid also so that leads to development of the glenohumeral arthritis as well as acromiohumeral arthritis because of there is no cuff in between humeral head and the acromion that leads to developments of rotator cuff arthropathy so here you can see this is extreme left is the normal shoulder joint where the shoulder uh, humeral head is staying into the joint in the rotator cuff tear humeral head is start going up so center of rotation going up and in the reverse shoulder we keep the center of rotation down and medial 
so that's the this uh, deltoid uh, muscle act as a adductor and because of the medialized joint it's become a stable one so this is the principle of reverse shoulder orthoplasty which was first designed by the charles neal uh, but there was limitation of this design because of the fairly constraint there was high chances of the glenoid component loosening at the same time implant breakage and also there was lateralization of the center of the rotation so in 1985 the paul gromand came with the nobel concept of the ball and socket design that based on the four principle that started with the first the shifting the center of rotation from lateral to the medial here we can see here so this is the shoulder joint so this if you see almost the center of rotation somewhere lie there normally but in case of the reverse shoulder this goes there so this much of the shifting of center of rotation from uh, the lateral side to the medial side the, how this helps uh, shifting this decreases the moment torque mechanical torque over the glenoid base plate so the glenoid loosening become less the second principle was to keep the humeral head lower from where it is so this this lowering leads to tension the deltoid muscle and this increases the muscle fiber firing both anterior as well as posterior so all the deltoid act as a abductor of the humeral head so this compensate for the deficiency of your rotator cuff next is the third principle the center of rotation become medial and the distal so this medialize and distalize center of rotation gives the stable implant so joint become very much stable than the natural joint and also this distalization and medialization says there was 42% increase in the deltoid moment arm so this gives the power to deltoid to act as a abductor throughout the range of the motion of the shoulder joint in case of reverse shoulder orthoplasty the fourth principle was the glenosphere glenosphere the implant that uh, resides over the glenoid part is the large glenosphere so because of the large glenosphere this gives the high range of motion almost up to 110 degree on, around the shoulder joint so all these four principle gave, was given by the gramant reverse shoulder orthoplasty and if you see the implant wise so humeral head is usually a straight and the cut of the neck shaft angle was 155 that was high in that time and over that there was the inlay humeral liner and on the glenoid side there was the glenoid base plate and over that there is the gleno sphere that that was almost half of a sphere so this gives the satisfactory elevation but because of excessive medialization the price has to be paid in form of the scapular notching so now in this discussion over the optimal fixation about the that is about the implant implant design at the same time the positioning of the implant also so this implant design and the positioning of implant main focus over to decrease the scapular notching as well as reduce the micro motion of the implant and this has start with the uh, the placement of the glenoid base plate that should be the flush to the inferior rim of the glenoid as well as uh, if anything has to be overhang that should be on the inferior side and there is also there is little bit glenoid lateralization also this prevent the again scapular notching and this glenoid lateralization can be up to 8 to 10 mm and if anything tilting it should be the inferior not superior even if inferior tilting again decreases the scapular notching but only inferior tilting then you need to do the reaming of the glenoid much more then that will not be effective so inferior tilting should be added with the glenoid lateralization at the same time 
and also of course the last glenoid a glenosphere that is in anything in between 38 to 40 having high survival rate and the the next shaft angle that was initially 155 now it has 135 uh, people preferred it so again this prevent the scapular notching also and about the placement of the glenoid base plate even up to 50 percent of the glenoid base plate support over the bone is good enough and Anything up to 25 degree of retroversion is acceptable. So about the indication, it is start with the rotator cuff arthropathy that we have seen previously also. There is no cuff in between the humeral head and the glenoid. So because of a humeral head and the acromion, so because of the pull of the deltoid, this humeral head keep going up. And so this rub over the under surface of the acromion as well as the glenoid surface that leads to development of the arthritis, particularly with the massive rotator cuff tear, this happens. And the treatment is reverse shoulder orthoplasty. So this deals with the arthritis component also. At the same time, because of deficiency of the cuff, you need to have abductor also. So this deals with the abduction also because after uh, uh, reverse shoulder orthoplasty, your deltoid become the abductor of your shoulder joint. Next indication is the pseudo paralysis. What is that? So there is, there is full passive range of motion, but hardly there is active range of motion over the shoulder joint in absence of any neurological injury. That is called as the pseudo paralysis. You can see here, this lady is 62 year female having full passive range of motion, but the active, hardly there is any movement at the shoulder joint. She has to lift or rotate whole of his body for the abduction or any rotation movement. So this is called as the case of, this is a case of pseudo paralysis. There was no neurological injury. The active range of motion was hardly any active range of motion, but passive range of motion was full. And this is this was because of this. This was the MRI of this lady. There is complete uh, massive tear of uh, the rotator cuff as well as the humeral head was migrated up. Here you can see also. And uh, on the axial section where we assess the muscle bulk of the uh, cuff, here you can see almost this is below the this tangent line. So almost more than 50% of the uh, muscle belly was lost. So there was massive fatty infiltration also. So along with the massive rotator cuff, there was grade four uh, fatty infiltration in this case also. So this was a case of pseudo paralysis because of all these changes in the cuff. And this was treated with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. This was after the two and a half month of follow up. This was the clinical of this two and a half month of follow-up. So we can see here, she is abducting her shoulder. So in this case, there is no rotator cuff, but abduction is possible because of the uh, deltoid uh, moment arc that get increases uh, because of the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. And this is after the uh, four and four four and a half month of this lady. Here you can see. There is full abduction and also she is lifting a little bit of weight also and she is doing all her activity. So next indication is uh, three or four part fracture, uh, proximal humerus fracture, particularly uh, the age is more than 70 uh, year where uh, the reconstruction is almost uh, uh, impossible or uh, there is head splitting fracture or poor bone quality, significant osteopenia or uh, the greater tuberosity has poor potential for the healing. Next indication when the, uh, the hemi-orthoplasty or total ortho, uh, total shoulder orthoplasty failed uh, with the, there was absence of the cuff. So this uh, can be treated with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty.
next indication when there is arthritis along with the degenerative cuff. So if we have to deal with the two problems, degenerated cuff along with the arthritis. Again, 70-year lady with bilateral shoulder joint arthritis with, you can see there was degenerated cuff in this case was again. So again, this patient was treated with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty where the center of rotation get medialized and lowered on so that the, the deltoid act as a abductor in this case. And also, uh, there is uh, rheumatoid arthritis cases, uh, uh, arthritis of the shoulder joint in rheumatoid patient. But in that case, you have to check for the glenoid bone stock, whether it's sufficient or not. If it is sufficient, then this can be treated with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. There is a lot of contraindication for reverse shoulder orthoplasty also. So starting with the axillary nerve dysfunction, again, you have to differentiate in between temporary and the permanent because the in trauma cases a um, couple of cases will have temporary axillary nerve dysfunction dysfunction so have to be separated from the permanent then there is deltoid deficiency is there this is the uh, contraindication for reverse shoulder orthoplasty if it is global deficiency but uh, uh, people some people are doing uh, in partial deltoid deficiency there also, and they are showing a uh, good result with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. When there is acromion deficiency is there where uh, this deltoid get attached. Again, this is the contraindication. Then there is a uh, glenoid uh, uh, bone uh, host problem in form of osteoporosis, osteopenia uh, is there. Then again, this is a contraindication on the of course like any joint, if there is any infection, then this surgery should be contraindicated. About the complication, so most common is the scapular notching, and it was almost in uh, 44 to 96 percent cases of the Gremont uh, type of prosthesis. And this was mainly because of the, the cut of the humeral head was almost at 155 degree, so, uh, because so that uh, this center of rotation should be medialize effectively to get a stable joint and that leads to a scapular notching and uh, this incidence get decreases uh, with the lateralization of the base plate uh, over the glenoid and other risk factor if this glenoid base plate become uh, placed superiorly or tilted superiorly uh, instead of inferior tilting or inferior uh, placement then again the risk become high and also a very high medialized center of rotation. And there is uh, increased risk associated with the high BMI also. Then another uh, risk uh, complication is the dislocation. So incidence is almost in between 2 to 3.4 percent. And usually uh, this is the most common cause of early failure. So um, then risk factor in dislocation says irreparable subscapular risk that is the strongest risk because there is no support entirely again there is if there is proximal humeral bone loss or those having failed hemi or total orthoplasty have high chances of dislocation rate in comparison to uh, reverse shoulder in other cases and also proximal humerus non-union other risk factor is the glenoid loosening if glenoid loosening is there or acromial or scapular spine fracture is there, or anything if there is deep infection. And that is um, many a time uh, this uh, 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 joint, initially there is no hardly any infection, but patient comes with uh, one or two months of surgery with the deep infection. That is another complication of this uh, reverse of the first. Thank you. Sir, is there, sir. John, sir, has joined. Uh, so, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, already joined. Maybe uh, he's having some problem there. So, uh, uh, while we are waiting for the question, sir, the one thing... Uh, yeah, I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Good evening, Good evening, sir. Internet problems here. With, I'm in Kabini. Uh, it's a jungle resort, so 
in between the electricity went off, then the internet came, then it just went off for a moment. So anyway, so, so that was excellent. Uh, uh, heard most of it except the beginning. A uh, couple of things. Uh, how do you, what, what are your uh, guides to the proper tilting of the uh, sphere? So, uh, glenoid base plate, uh, you have base plate, yeah. the this uh, jig for the placement uh, over the glenoid. So, at least inferior parts should be covered with that jig. Jig comes with the different sizes. So, whatever the size is, you should place. So, inferior two-thirds should be covered with that jig. And there is central hole in that jig. Over that, you place your guide wire. So, anything... If you have any confusion about whether it's going superior or any dot, so it should be always in the toward the uh, direction should be little bit down so that it should be the inferior tilting. But the jig almost guide you for the placement of the central guide wire. So that will also guide your uh, tilt, is it? Yeah, tilt also you as can, well as you can have the guide wire via central but have it tilted. Up or down, whichever way you want. Yeah. So as you place, uh, suppose this is the glenoid, and you have placed the jig like this. So you can lift your arm like this also, or this also. So if you lift your arm up, so it means your uh, tilting is superior. And if you lift your arm down, it means tilting is inferior. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. But how do you judge exactly how much to tilt it? So uh, again, okay. as you place this, suppose this get flush, jig get flush with the glenoid, and you just drill over that. That is the perfect uh, 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 tilting of your uh, uh, glenoid base plate. So uh, going on with that, is there a role for navigation or robotics in this? Yeah, nowadays, uh, this particularly for the placement of this glenoid base plate, because the mostly problem comes from the glenoid side. Yeah. A uh, lot of center have they started doing under navigation uh, with that. Even uh, this, uh, the pre-op planning with this. Uh, uh, yeah, again. 3D reconstruction and printing. 3D reconstruction with the glenoid is also a lot of center are doing with this. Yeah. Uh, there is one question asked by Dr. Sachin is what is the indication if uh, it is head splitting fracture? So first uh, of all has to be uh, see the physiological age of the patient. Um, what is the physiological age? Uh, if uh, very elderly more than 70 year head splitting fracture bone is osteoporotic looks like it will fail with the osteosynthesis. So uh, patient can be treated with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty. In fact, incidence of reverse shoulder orthoplasty in head splitting fracture in recent year has gone up very high. Uh, sir uh, will give expert comment over that, but in the uh, West or US, the incidence is uh, doing treatment with the reverse shoulder for this type of fracture is very high in elderly Yeah, but I think uh, by and large, you should try and restrict it to the older patients because in the younger patient, you want to avoid the reverse shoulder arthroplasty because we still do not have very long-term results of them. And over 10 years, the older prosthesis have had a problem with deltoid weakening. Yeah. So I think the newer generation prosthesis with the slight lateralization of the base plate, et cetera, may have less problems, but we don't know the uh, long-term results of those as yet. So I think try and reserve it for younger, uh, older patients where you know that you cannot reconstruct uh, the shoulder adequately and your fixation is likely to fail. So in those ones, it's better to do a primary reverse than have to do a secondary reverse after failure of your fixation, just like it is for the hemi. Uh, so if it is uh, uh, not uh, if it is total shoulder arthroplasty that may be a choice uh, in older patient or or reverse is preferred over total. I think if total it is shoulder history. for trauma has more or less more or less gone out of vogue. Okay, so you either do a hemi in the younger patient 
where you think the rotator cuffs are still good and you can reconstruct the tuberosities adequately. Or if, if it's an older patient where you are not able to reconstruct adequately, you would probably go directly to a reverse then worry about a total elbow, total shoulder arthroplasty. Arvind, what's your take on that? Yeah, same. Uh, if anything can be done, then the hemi or uh, reverse shoulder, not uh, total shoulder for proximal humerus fracture. But in younger patients, you want to try your best to reconstruct it reconstruct. as far as possible. So primarily, that is your aim. If you re have a situation where you can't, so in many of these, you should have uh, the really bad fractures. You should have the option of a hemiarthroplasty. There is also a, a third option, which is called a, the just unique, which is where you just replace the head. Fracture part of it. Just the fractured part of the head and suture the tuberosities back into place. So that is something which we do not have in much experience with or we don't have any experience of our own with. But uh, the problem is it doesn't work very well in the elderly patient. It works better in the younger patient. Okay. So, so if it is uh, reconstructable, so we can uh, do osteosynthesis. If not, then hemi in younger patients, sir. Or this just unique is an option with which is somewhere in between. Because okay. you can convert it later into whatever you like. So uh, one question asked by Dr. Visujit Prakash that any surgical landmark to decide the tilt of a glenoid, what you was discussing, sir. So we have just discussed about that. Yeah. So first is the jig. Uh, first, I start with the uh, shift of the glenoid. It should be plus completely in the inferior part of the glenoid rib. It should not be the above to the inferior part of the glenoid. Then the, your jig, again, should be over the plus or anything tilting. It should be tilted inferior jig. It should not be tilted superiorly. That has to be taken care of at the time of making the drill, the central guide wire placement over the glenoid. And uh, as, as a corollary to that, the most important thing is to get a good exposure of the glenoid. Okay. 360. Have a good exposure of the glenoid, you will end up in problems with your positioning. So, uh, 360 degrees of the glenoid, and that will make it more, it will make it easier for you to position it exactly where you need to. So, Dr. Sachin has asked what role of deltoid liver arm if we do medialize or lateralize the glenoid base plate. So, with the uh, medialization and lateralization, it's the more the main is the inferior inferior center of rotation. So, if you make it inferior, so length of your uh, deltoid get increased. So, this become tense. So this act as the full abductor of uh, your shoulder joint. Even the posterior deltoid also and anterior deltoid also along with the lateral deltoid become the abductor. Not only the lateral deltoid, anterior and posterior deltoid also become abductor in that case. So it's the main thing is the inferior placement of your center of rotation. So with the reverse shoulder orthoplasty, it become possible to the inferior placement with the glenoesphere become large and your concave, uh, this humeral articulating surface. So, center of rotation become inferior. So, anyway, when you're doing a reverse shoulder, you're going to medialize the center of rotation of the head. Okay? Because just look at it uh, in mechanical terms. Your center of rotation when you have your head is at the center of the head, which is way, way lateral to the glenoid. When you put a glenosphere on that side, on the glenoid side, then your center of rotation automatically shifts medially. So your lever arm for the deltoid increases. So now in the initial prosthesis, this increase was thought and is now thought to have been too much. So you try to reduce that medialization by lateralizing the base plate and the inferior tilt. Okay. But you so you are still medializing the center of rotation, but not as much as you would do in the traditional. Reverse to shoulder arthritis. Okay. Any. Uh, so, 
Arvind, that's okay? Yeah, absolutely, that's right, sir. So it has started with the extreme medial ISL. Then yeah. there was uh, scapular notching and a lot of glenoid loosening was there. So and also long-term, the deltoid uh, fatigues. Fatigue and uh, a lot road. of weakness of the deltoids was there. So uh, such as they start doing extreme lateral ISL, almost 8 to, 8 to 10 uh, millimeter from whatever the Paul Groman has advised. Then again, there was in between. So almost now it is 2 to 4 <laughs> millimeter from the Paul Groman. Uh, people are using that uh, center of rotation. So you're still medializing, but not as much as the original prosthesis. Yeah. Yes, sir, sir. Uh, one question is about the rocking horse phenomena. That... Uh, rocking horse complication and treating option. So it is uh, abnormal phenomena, sir. First thing to understand. Yeah. So this term at uh, first time. So rocking horse phenomena, you mean to say? Yes, sir. Okay. I don't know exactly. Yeah. I think you should explain it. Sir. It's better. Because uh, in complication, they have given one. In, uh, I know, like, I, you've asked this question before in another webinar, so you should answer this. Rocking horse in that <laughs> you one. Turn now. In that one, it was not discussed, sir. Rocking horse in last it, week. It has been. <laughs> yeah. So, I think it's better if we'll see it once. So, uh, the other thing about the notching, sir, what he was explaining, one thing you told that it should be uh, tilted inferiorly. Any other things we can take care while doing the surgery, sir, in the technique? So the positioning, okay. So if you are too high, then again you will get notching, okay, whether the tilt or not. And also Please. first start with the 360 degree exposure. That is hmm. very important. And he has always fear of this actually now. But uh, you just uh, place your, uh, this glenoid retractor, uh, just subperiosteal, so there is hardly any injury to the axillary nerve. So uh, first thing is, has to be very careful exposure, removal of your, all the labrum, that is very important. And after that, you place your jig, you look for complete flushing, even if anything, one to two millimeter down in the inferior side, there is no problem, it should not be up. And second thing is the tilting. And same, all these things has to be maintained. Because once after making the first drill, then you drill central peg. So again, while drilling the central peg, you have to be very careful so that your hand should not go like this, up. It should be down. And also at the time of placement of the implant. Because it's not very uh, fixed type of thing, your guide wire or your drilling. So you can go up and down, but always your... Uh, this hand should be toward inferior side. So this uh, notching is also a problem in total shoulder, sir? No, total shoulder, hardly there is a problem with the notching because it's opposite. The humeral head is wrong. So hardly your stem, and this stem neck will go in, in touch with this. So this is the anatomic to total shoulder. So there is no problem with that notching. So, in your lecture, you told about the dislocation. Chance of dislocation is more in reverse shoulder. So, what uh, we can do to reduce that? No, there chance. is chance is almost 2 to 3.4 percent. So, reverse shoulder is very uh, inherently stable joint because it gets mesialized and inferior. So, chances of dislocation is less in comparison to other, any or total. So, it's stable in comparison to other. So, but even uh, there is dislocation happens. One thing is the weakening of this deltoid. And again, because this uh, tension of this deltoid measurement intraoperatively is a little bit uh, not very objective. It's a subjective thing. So anything, if your deltoid remain lax, then the chances of dislocation again there. Subscap, if you repair it, then it's become very good thing. Uh, but in, uh, the literature says if subscap is not repairable, then the chances of dislocation in that case is high. But a lot of surgeons don't do repair of the, uh, the subscap uh, anymore. So, 
uh, what we have seen is uh, that Glen White part is always uncemented, cementless, and the this side, sir, may be cemented or uncemented. That both is possible. So on the humeral side, on the humeral side, it uh, may be cemented, may be uncemented, whatever you want. The company make both cemented and uncemented. But Glen White is always a uh, cement. Glen White is yeah, uh, always it's uncemented for reverse solder. For primary solder, it's cement. Because you have to get a peg into the thing, no? Yeah, peg into the central part of the Glen White so that you have punches with a very strong and two S two one uh, proximal and one superior and one inferior at least two S two. And the rocking horse phenomenon is essentially because you get you have eccentric loading. So if you don't have central loading of your prosthesis, you will get eventually loosening of the prosthesis. So that's been termed a rocking horse phenomenon because a rocking horse, the movement is not strictly spherical. It's okay. So that's why they call it the rocking horse phenomenon. Uh, one thing which is a little confusing while doing surgery is how to uh, maintain the retroversion. So just if on briefly if you can explain because uh, at that time you told the hat and position should be like this and uh, to put the implants. The implant, retroversion. So. retroversion of the head. Uh, and, uh, yes, sir. In retroversion of the head, the humeral part. So, a lot of company comes with the jig over your tri. So, at the time of placing your jig in the humeral head, there is trial 20 degree, 30 degree, 40 degree rod is there. And place your arm in between 20 to 40 degree. So, almost anything around 30 degree of retroversion is good enough. Even if it is not there, but uh, in the humeral head trial, that wire is not there. That then you can check with your elbow. So keep the elbow in 30 degree of external rotation and then your humeral trial is anterior, complete anterior. So this makes almost 30 degree of retroversion of your... So you look at the transepicondylar axis. Yeah. Okay. In neutral position, that will be at 90 degrees. So you internally rotated 20, 25 degrees, it should be the correct position, okay. So I think, sir, uh, we have covered most yeah. of the questions. And it was great, sir, to listen. So, thanks very much, everybody. And I'm sorry I joined a bit late, but uh, it was impossible to join any earlier because of the power outage that was here. And uh, until next week. Next week, what is on? So uh, we'll have uh, that uh, Ganjuwala sir class yeah. on uh, CP cerebral palsy okay. management Follow and to the last lecture on CP. Yes, sir. Continuation of that. So until next week, bye everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It is great. I'm sorry.